Right. So I'm just going to, I've just joined because there wasn't very many people in the waiting room. So I just thought I'd let you guys in. And then as people come, I'll just let them join in. We've got um, 34 booked on for tonight. So I'm assuming everyone else is just running a little bit late. So I'll just go through the usual things. Like I say, um, we are recording this for this evening. So if you have told your wives that you're somewhere else and you shouldn't be here, um, obviously take your name off the screen or whatever. Um, uh, please keep yourself on mute um, throughout the presentation just because if I hear other people pouring a glass of wine, I get jealous. Um, for your inf information this evening, um, we have no planned fire alarm. So should your fire alarm go off, please make your way to your nearest exit. I don't know where that is. You do. Um, the event tonight is obviously NRLA. It's our quarterly meeting. So we've got the lovely Vic with us tonight, going to go through a presentation with regards to the opening of the courts on Monday, the eviction process and what we expect to happen with regards to the possession orders and how courts are going to work. And then we've got an open Q&A for you at the end. So if any questions that you've got, um, either put them in the chat or afterwards, I'll let you unmute yourselves and ask the questions. And that will be a free for all, really. Um, with regards to personal questions as well. Normally I say we can't answer personal questions, but we'll try our hardest um, this time to do that um, with regards to the, the opening of the courts and where your possession orders or notices are. So without further ado, I will hand over to Vic and um, over to you. Brilliant. Uh, thanks very much, Julie, for inviting me along again. And uh, good evening, everybody. Um, we are, um, I can't remember whether Julie's um, uh, said this or not, but uh, we're going to focus quite heavily tonight um, on the new court process um, to do with uh, dealing with the possession proceedings. Um, as you all know, the courts have been uh, closed up until very recently, um, but they're back online again. So, um, as I said, most of my presentation is going to be focused around that side of things. So. Um, let's um, get into this. If you just bear with me a second, I shall share my screen with you uh, so that you can see the presentation. There we go. There we go. Hopefully that's... Um, available for all of you to see. So, um, uh, Julie, is that uh, visible? Yep, perfect, in full yep. screen. Marvellous, good. Okay, so um, there we go. Uh, this is our legislative update for September. Uh, my name is uh, Vic Dawes. Uh, I'm the area rep for the NRLA covering southeast regions of Berkshire, 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 Bucks and Oxfordshire. Um, Going to talk to you tonight, as I said to you, uh, mostly around uh, the reopening of the courts and the new processes that are in place. So uh, the agenda tonight is the extension um, of the court closure, the new process for possession that's now come into place. I'm going to talk a little about um, what the NRLA have actually been campaigning um, as well uh, during this process um, with the government um, to provide assistance uh, both for landlords and tenants alike, and maybe um, give you some information and some opportunity to perhaps get involved there yourselves as well, if you have a mind to. Um, I'm going to talk about um, some guidance that we've produced um, on managing rent arrears. Um, and then there's just a few things I'm going to touch on at the end um, that we, we may not have, uh, or we might have forgotten um, since they've come into being. The Green Homes Grants, um, available to landlords, five-year um, electrical installation safety checks, which are now compulsory as of uh, June this year. Uh, I'm going to update you on the government's proposals for making tax digital. Um, and also just briefly um, let you all know, if you're members of the NRLA, um, details of our new licensing toolkit for members. Uh, incidentally, um, if any of you are not members but are interested in becoming members, um, then do get in touch with me. Um, or alternatively, if you want to go ahead and, and apply, you'll have seen um, a little code um, R129, which you can actually use as part of your application process to, to get a, a, a discount on your first year's subscriptions. So, on we go. So, 
Um, as we um, are all no doubt familiar with the fact that the government uh, at the 11th hour decided on a U-turn to extend the, uh, the court closure um, for a further period of time, uh, whereby we've finally seen them reopen on the 21st of September, Monday just gone. There have been um, some changes, as I alluded to, um, but essentially, um, in a nutshell, uh, the biggest changes are to uh, notice periods and effectively the default situation for Section 21 and most Section 8 grounds is now six months where um, it was um, three months previously having been extended already from their normal uh, timescales. Uh, there are certain exceptions being for domestic abuse cases where the timescale is two weeks antisocial behavior, four weeks, uh, rent arrears of six months or more, uh, four weeks, um, right to rent breaches, three months, and false statements, two weeks. So, um, <clears throat> new procedures. So, um, the new rules basically mean that um, landlords are going to need to use a reactivation notice to notify the court and the tenant that they want to continue with possession proceedings. Now, this is actually quite a crucial document um, and the rule applies to accelerated possession cases and the government says it will ensure that the court's time is spent on the right cases. That remains to be seen, but we shall see. Um, a reactivation notice, however, will not be needed for any claim where a possession order has already been granted which basically means that landlords can now move to execute the warrants via bailiff services. The NRLA um, does have a uh, template of the government's um, uh, reactivation notice available to download, but as you can see, you can also go direct to the government website um, to download it as well. So <clears throat> what does that actually mean in, in reality? Well, um, landlords must now submit any relevant information about the tenant's circumstances, including the impact of uh, COVID-19 on, on tenants. Um, I'm not sure how this is really going to work because I was just saying to Julie earlier, um, this is very much providing uh, judges um, with an opportunity to basically be more subjective than objective because if in the judge's opinion, they're not happy that the landlord has made sufficient um, attempts to uh, deal with uh, issues and help the tenant out, then they're gonna be able to adjourn cases. Um, and also if you're not providing that information, they will automatically likely adjourn your case. Um, the court is also gonna have more flexibility around the hearing dates. Um, we. Uh, won't, uh, they won't need to set them when a claim form is issued um, and there's been a suspension of the requirement to hold them within eight weeks of the claim form being issued. Uh, landlords also now need to provide rent arrears history in advance of the hearing rather than the court hearing itself um, and High Court bailiffs are also going to be required to provide notice of the eviction date to the tenant in the same way as the County Court bailiffs already do. So. Quite a, few, uh, quite a few changes there to be aware of. Um, as I said, the details um, are available through the government uh, websites. Uh, a note for you, um, good old Christmas is around the corner uh, and the government has uh, included a holiday period or a restrictive period over the Christmas break. So all evictions will be restricted over the Christmas period except in cases of antisocial behavior and domestic abuse. Um, bailiffs will be specifically instructed not to evict. Um, landlords can still pursue proceedings, but won't be able to enforce. And uh, the period of this winter truce, as we call it, uh, is from the 11th of December through to the 11th of January. So, um, what are the judges going to be looking at? Well, um, they've been asked to prioritize cases and this is basically the criteria the judges are going to be using to uh, prioritize the cases that they actually hear. 
So uh, we're looking at mainly allegations of antisocial behavior, um, extreme alleged rent arrears accrued. So um, we are talking in this instance equal to at least 12 months rent, which is a whopping amount of rent when you consider if you are taking somebody to court, you've got to wait for them to get into arrears by 12 months, and then you've got the process to follow thereafter. So that's going to be some rent arrears by the time you've finished and, and, and hopefully managed to get um, your tenants out. Um, also, nine months rent, where that is over 25% of a private landlord's total annual income from any source. So fairly, fairly prescriptive um, requirements there in terms of how it impacts the, the landlord's income. Alleged squatters, illegal occupiers or persons unknown. Um, allegations of domestic violence where possession of the property is alleged to be important for particular reasons which are set out in claim form. Um, and also including the fact that any domestic violence agencies have been alerted as well. Uh, cases of allegations of fraud or deception, um, unlawful subletting, uh, uh, allegations of abandon, abandonment of the property um, or non-occupation through uh, death of the defendant. Uh, also, where the property has been allocated by an authority as temporary accommodation and is specifically needed by the authority to reallocate as temporary accommodation. So um, the NLA um, has been working together with the MHCRG to bring in what we call a, a best practice guide for landlords um, in terms of providing them with a pre-action plan they should look to follow for rent disputes. Um, it is voluntary, um, but landlords are encouraged to follow. Um, and it's a good um, uh, working practice to adopt as um, the courts will hopefully um, look to these areas um, as evidence that uh, landlords have actually made positive attempts to communicate with their tenant um, and to, to, to resolve issues before coming to court. So we've, we've, we've put together nine what we call golden rules. They're not all going to be um, down to um, the landlord's likes necessarily, um, but having said that, as we said, it's, it's best practice um, that you do follow it and, and hopefully by doing so it will help your your situation through the court so what are we asking you to do well communicate with the tenant uh, establish whether the tenant is vulnerable signpost the tenant to organizations who can support and advise the tenant um, agree an affordable repayment plan be clear by providing quarterly rent statements showing any temporary changes so that the tenants are always um, aware of where they stand as far as any arrears is concerned. Um, consent from tenants, direct payments of housing elements of benefits. Uh, don't forget guarantors, they should always be involved in, in discussions as well um, because uh, at the end of the day, um, it does fall upon the guarantors if the tenants fail um, in their obligations uh, to meet the, the requirements of the tenancy. Uh, mediation, if you can't agree, and crucially, make sure you record all contact with the tenant. So as much as possible, um, once you've opened a line of communication with the tenant, it's a good idea to, to try and do it um, in a written format, so there's an audit trail, but if not, um, then at least make sure that you do record the times and dates and the content of your conversation with the tenants that you can actually provide as evidence um, in a court process. Um, <clears throat> with regards to managing rent arrears, um, the NRLA has actually been working with sector partners to release some guidance to hopefully support landlords and tenants to manage rent arrears during the current um, uh, coronavirus situation. So, um, as we alluded to before, it includes advice on early communication, how to agree rent deferrals, reductions and suspensions, um, provides support for tenants on applying for benefits and signposts them to resources to help with budget planning. Um, all of those are available free to NRLA um, members um, through the uh, resource uh, section on our website. Now, what have we been involved in doing? Um, because I think um, a lot of members uh, do ask, 
how the NRLA is, is actively involved in pressing government for action. Um, we were quite vociferous um, in requesting the government not to extend the ban on possession proceedings any further um, with the lockdown having been lifted. Um, in our opinion, the rationale behind court closures uh, no longer exists and further extensions would only serve to increase tenant debt and, and build a longer queue for the courts to deal with. Um, there's been quite a lot of talk, uh, industry talk, about um, getting the government to look at providing support, again, um, not just for landlords, but tenants as well. So interest-free government guaranteed hardship loans for tenants um, has been on the agenda, whereby it provides tenants with a means to pay off COVID-related arrears um, and sustains tenancies and removes the risk of eviction as furlough is removed, because that's around the corner. Um, October is where the furlough schemes come to an end, and that's where generally in the industry we're expecting a spike in uh, arrears situations, because most people um, have been pretty much keeping things up to date um, during the furlough period. And the instances and examples of, of um, arrears and evictions has been fairly limited, to be perfectly honest with you. But now, with further coming to an end, I think this is where we're going to start to see the spikes. Um, so we're asking for, for these payments to be paid directly to landlords. Also, income support for landlords. Um, if a tenant refuses or is unable to take up a loan, then landlords must be able to cover the arrears through grants as well, because in a lot of cases, a lot of professional landlords are dependent on rents um, as their main source of income. So take action. Um, as much as uh, uh, as an organisation, we um, sort of ballot the government on, on policies, etc. Um, we also need the help of our members and general landlords um, to actually get in touch and, and make a noise themselves, add to our voice if you like. So we're asking landlords generally to write to your MP um, or speak to them at uh, the constituency surgeries. Ask them to write on your behalf to the Prime Minister and the Secretary of State um, to express your concerns. Um, make sure though that you have sort of valid relevant experiences that you can share with them to illustrate how the changes have affected you and your business. Um, back us um, and our campaigns. Um, again, as NRLA members, um, we have a, a link on our website where you can actually uh, write to uh, the MP. Um, and if you give me a moment, um, there's actually um, there's a useful note um, I meant to. Uh, where are we? No, I can't find, but basically through the, the, the tool that we have on our website, um, the actual tool takes you through um, constructing um, a letter um, that will have the right content to hopefully have a, a positive impact when writing to your MP. So that's um, the bit on, on the possession proceedings and, and managing the situation through COVID. As I said earlier, there's a few other things I just wanted to touch on as well. Um, you may or may not be familiar with, we've got Greenham's grant, which is available until 31st of March next year. So the government has allocated 2 billion towards the Greenham's grant scheme uh, from the end of uh, this month. It effectively entitles homeowners, including landlords, to a voucher up to two thirds of the cost of energy efficiency measures up to 5,000 pounds per property. Um, tenants on, on benefits can actually apply um, for 100% of the cost of energy efficiency measures. Um, so that's an extra benefit for them. Um, it needs to include a primary measure such as insulation or low carbon heating to be eligible for funding um, uh, for secondary measures. Check um, what your property is eligible for. Again, there's an online tool um, that's been provided by the government. Um, simpleenergyadvice.org.uk um, forward slash pages forward slash Greenhams grant. A lot of this information, as I said, um, 
if you uh, need more information, then please do contact me. I'm happy to share this information again with you um, if you've missed it tonight. Uh, you may all also be aware that uh, new legislation came in um, basically for uh, electrical installation safety checks to be carried out and compulsorily for all new tenancies. Um, it came in from the 1st of July 2020 for new tenancies granted from the 1st of June 2020. There was a little bit of confusion with the government's initial guidance because it was uh, misinterpreted as coming in from June 1st of June 2020 applicable for all tenancies from the 1st of July um, but it's actually the other way around it's all tenancies from the 1st of June um, and that's all new tenancies um, existing pre-existing tenancies the requirement is from the 1st of April 2021 um, must have these certificates in place uh, it's a five-year certification uh, tenants must be given copies of the report within 28 days and new tenants uh, must be provided a copy of the certificate uh, prior to the tenancy starting. There are three um, categories, if you like, of, of recommendations. Uh, the certificate will either have a satisfactory or an unsatisfactory classification. Uh, in the event of an unsatisfactory classification, as I said, there's a C1 category of, of recommended works, which is the most important and must be done immediately as it's a danger, considered a potential danger to life. Uh, C2 category recommendations, um, again, need to be carried out within 28 days, after which time the property needs to be reinspected for a uh, further or a, a, a final certificate to be issued. Um, and again, the tenant must be provided with a copy of that within 28 days of completion. Penalties are fairly stiff. Um, it's a penalty of up to £30,000 per breach if landlords fail to comply. And I think finally on the news front uh, tonight, um, you're also probably familiar with the government's plans to make tax digital, uh, which is now being extended next year. So making tax digital will be extended to all VAT registered businesses below the 85k threshold from April 2022. Um, income tax returns for property uh, and business income over 10,000 from April the following year. Um, it's going to require taxpayers to keep digital records and use specific software to submit their tax returns. And the software will provide a return to HMRC each quarter. Uh, you will also need to submit a final declaration up to the end of the tax year, which replaces the current self-assessment scheme. Okay, um, I've whizzed through all of that now because I'm anticipating there's going to be quite a few questions uh, coming from the floor. Um, but um, just finally, um, I've just forgotten just to mention a new toolkit that the NLA, uh, NRLA rather have, have just um, launched. It's basically a new resource to help landlords understand and challenge discretionary licensing proposals. Um, it effectively lays out the guidance and requirements required of a local authority to introduce discretionary licensing. It includes downloadable resources and relevant case law breakdowns as well, and provides practical advice and tips on engaging with tenants and councillors during the consultation process. So more and more local authorities are considering introducing discretionary licensing, and it was generally felt there was a need for a, for a more permanent resource to be developed to help landlords have access to, uh, to help them uh, counter, shall we say, uh, council's proposals um, in that regard. Um, as always, um, we're looking to um, build the membership of the NRLA. Um, some of you may or may not uh, be aware the NRLA was born earlier this year out of the amalgamation of both the NLA and the RLA. So we've got of in excess of 80,000 members um, and we're growing. And I think with the advent of continued um, legislation and changes in the industry, um, a lot more landlords are looking for support and guidance, particularly those who self-manage. So some of the benefits available to you as members will provide you with unlimited telephone and online um, advice, access to over 130 documents and guides, representation government, 
uh, industry updates as we've, we've done tonight and quarterly magazines. Uh, the best deposit protection rates, free tax protection insurance, discounts on services, regional meetings when we get going again. We have been holding, um, like most people, um, online webinars um, on a monthly basis. Um, and I think uh, it's unlikely we're going to see any change in that um, for next year, certainly, uh, and possibly not even before the end of the next quarter, but uh, we shall see. Um, and we're also holding, we have specialist landlord training um, virtually, venue and online. So there are lots of different ways of um, improving your knowledge and understanding of the industry sector and, and the regulations and rules. Uh, as I said, um, there's a code there, R129. So anybody who's not a member who's, who's interested in becoming a member, use that code and it entitles you to a discount from your first year's premiums. Okay, um, that's me done for now. Um, I will stop blubbering on and um, I think we're probably open for questions now, Julie. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for that. It was really informative and I like the way that it's really just very concise because obviously I've been through the documentation and there is reams and reams of it. So I like the fact that this is really concise for everybody. So um, I'm going to open the floor. Has anybody got any questions relating to this specifically or anything else that you've got um, with regards to renting that you want to ask myself or Vic? Otherwise, this is going to be a very short meeting. <laughs> everyone's gone quiet okay i mean i'm going to go back to um, what you were talking about with regards to the electrical safety certificates there seems to be a bit of confusion out there with regards to um when to carry out a safety certificate now you and me know that it was, should have been for all new tenancies or it should have been for um, existing tenancies from April next year. But there's some electricians out there yep. are saying that it should be for every tenancy. So where has that sort of come from? Because there seems to be some kind of guidance that says it should be every tenancy rather than every five years. Yeah, I've, 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 I've had, <coughs> had this with my own, because uh, I'm, I'm a letting agency myself, and um, I've had um, this from some of my own uh, electricians as well that we use. Um, and, and it's coming, the, the guidance is, is, is coming from their own um, organizations, um, but it's, it's actually wrong. It, it's, it's the requirement is for you to have an electrical safety installation done um, uh, once every five years, copy of the certificate to be provided to every new tenant before the start of the tenancy. But that said, there is a requirement for landlords to have a responsibility for, to ensure that there's not been any changes in the property which may require new certification. So I, th I think the key there um, is that landlords are aware of what tenants are and aren't doing in their properties. I mean, for example, uh, my tenancy agreements have clauses in them which preclude tenants from um, adding new electrical installations, etc., cetera, um, without the prerequisite certification and testing having been carried out. So. That's the key, I suppose, is if there is a change in, in the installations in the property, then you really need to look at having a new one done. But other than that, no one certificate is valid for five years. Fabulous. Um, Patricia, you've got your hand up. Would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Yes, thank you very much. Very useful uh, session. Very, very My question is uh, the fact that I wanted to find out if I have a residential property and I have a right to let, and for the green, uh, you know the green thing that coming up, coming into place, is it possible for me to apply to apply, apply, or is it just one house? You're Sorry, I'm not now. sure whether you got that, Julie, but um, I really didn't hear pretty much any of that. Oh, okay. No, you're breaking you hear up, Patricia. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? That's better. Yeah, yeah. I can hear you now. Okay. So I have a residential property and I have a buy to let property. For the green, do you know the green thing, the green scheme that green you're talking crop. about? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Is it, uh, can I apply for my residential property and also apply for my buy to let? Or is it restricted to one house? 
Uh, no, I think the, the green grants are, are, are property driven. So oh, um, okay. as far as I'm aware, they're aware oh. that they are available per property. Oh, okay. So it doesn't really matter. I can apply for for the two properties. Yeah, if you if you um, if you saw the link earlier, um, yeah. if you go on to that link, um, you yeah. can actually follow the process, which will um, qualify you in terms of letting you know and confirming what, if any, mm. grants you're going to be eligible for. Yeah, I already confirmed for my property, but I didn't know whether I can do for the let, buy to let. Yeah, yeah, you should be able to do that as well. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you very much. No yes. problem. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Patricia. Um, Susan has asked in the chat, um, sorry, I missed what regulation is starting in April 2021? Yeah, that was just a reference to the electrical installation certification. So um, the, the legislation came in for all new tenancies in June of this year, um, but basically um, all pre-existing tenancies, properties with pre-existing tenancies will need to have an electrical installation safety certificate carried out um, by April 2021. So um, all new tenancies is currently the, 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 the regulation, um, but even if you have an ongoing tenancy, um, a periodic tenancy, etc., you will need to have a certificate in place for that for next year, April 2021. Thank you. So going back to with the courts opening on Monday and the new procedures in place um, for landlords and letting agents with regards to eviction, what sort of timeline are we looking at for landlords? So if they've already served their Section 21 or their Section 8 and they've put their application into court and then it got stayed. So now the courts have reopened. What have they got to do to get that moving and what sort of timelines are, are landlords looking at now to get their evictions? Well, that's that's a very very good question. Um, I mean, obviously the courts have opened on, on Monday, um, so it remains to be seen um, sort of how how long um, the processes are going to take. But I think that the key here is the reactivation notice. Um, that that I have to stress is if people have um, filed process pre uh, COVID. Um, then if you want to continue with that process, you must complete a reactivation notice, which requires you to take into consideration or, or evidence that you've taken into consideration um, the tenant's situation and how they've been or may have been impacted through the uh, coronavirus process. Um, and uh, even if you do that, it's going to be very much down to the judge that you're in front of on the day, as it were, as to whether they're happy that you've made the necessary steps or taken the necessary steps to resolve the situation before bringing it to court. So again, um, we, we were talking about this um, a little bit earlier um, because I think we're in a situation potentially here where there's a shift away from judges being re uh, required to um, act on points of law um, compared to going forward, potentially they're going to be much more open to being able to use their own discretion, um, you know, regardless of, of, of the law, as it, as it were. So uh, bottom line is, uh, if you get in front of a judge on a day and he's not happy that you've taken the right steps or you've not made any effort to, to, to take any steps, then your process will be adjourned. Okay. And what if people were preempting the legislation that was supposed to come in um, in August and obviously then came in in September instead, we got that month extension, and had already served um, a reactivation notice? Is that now valid or would they have to serve a new one um, for Monday? Uh, you've got me on that one, um, Julie. I don't know is the answer to that one. I don't know. The The... the the guidance, <clears throat> the guidance came out to us um, only a couple of days ago, um, in, in fairness. So I've not had um, an opportunity to go through it in, in, in depth myself. Um, we did run our own NRLA webinar on Monday um, and my colleagues went through the, 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 the presentation. Um, but uh, no, it's something, if, if somebody needs uh, to know that, then I'm, I'm happy to find that out and come back to you. It's not a problem. Okay. 
Thank you. Does anybody else have any questions? Otherwise, I'll just carry on rambling all evening. No one wants that. <laughs> no, we'll require it this evening. Okay. Has, has anybody got any experiences that they can share with us at the moment? No? All quiet. Very much. Is there a football though. match on or something we need to get to? <laughs> there probably is football. I bet that's what I've missed. There's a football match on. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, Su got... Susan, you've said yes. Have you got a question? Do you want to unmute yourself, if you have? Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, perfect. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I just put, I've got a running thread on uh, HMO site. So, um, I had a tenant move in. Well, I had a road tenant move out, which caused basically eight months worth of loss of rent because of um, everything. He didn't pay rent, and then there was a lot of damage. So, he had a new tenant move in, and within just under one month, she handed the keys back to the agency and said the place wasn't for her. And the agent accepted the keys and then said to us, oh, well, it doesn't matter because we've got a new tenant. And I said, no, no, they, 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 these people can't just behave like this. This is a legally binding AST. So, and the deposits held with DPS and I'm speaking to people and they're saying they're quite tight on them. Um, us trying to withhold this deposit on the basis of breach of contract um, and also she reported one new thing broken which we still haven't they haven't got they're basically the agent is not really responding very well to us so where do we stand on that can we keep the deposit basically I'm just just seeking clarification did, did you say that the tenant handed their key in after a month, but the agent was happy to accept it on the basis that they had somebody to move straight back in. Yeah, that's so I've been taking advice and they're saying that the agent shouldn't have accepted the key. They should have discussed it with us first. So uh, yeah, the agent made yeah, the decision. Yeah, I, I think I would tend to agree with that. That it, Basically, the best course of action would have been that when this uh, situation arose, the agent should have been in touch with you to say, look, this is the situation. Um, are you happy to release them from their obligations? Because we've actually got somebody to move in, which will, as a result, <clears throat> as a result of which you're not going to suffer any financial loss. Um, because in my own circumstance, you know, if I have um, fixed term tenancy agreements and for whatever reason tenants want to uh, terminate early, um, we generally will go back to the tenants and say, yeah, we're happy to release you from your obligations subject to a new tenant being found and no financial loss being being suffered by the landlord. So on the one hand, yes, um, the letting agent, if they were doing their job properly, should have discussed the matter with you uh, at the outset rather than make their own unilateral decision on, on, on how to proceed. Um, but on the, on the other hand, um, I don't think you're going to have any joy with being able to retain any of the deposit because you've not actually suffered any financial loss. I guess it's, yeah, I'm mixing up two cases. It's the previous tenant who they didn't check references properly. We didn't get a deposit and just, we, well, we're lucky he moved out, I suppose. Um, so when this, you know, trouble with the next tenant immediately pops up and she's just like, well, I don't like the place. Um, yeah, I, my sort of stance is, well, no, people can't behave like this. So just based on breach of contract, I'm saying no, you can't. Yeah, you it's, 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 it's a breach. It's technically, it's a breach of contract. But unfortunately, uh, because you haven't suffered any financial loss, you're not going to be able to claim any compensation. You know, <laughs> if, if you had, for example, um, incurred in, in the old days, I suppose, if you incurred costs because your agency had charged costs, etc., um, to put in place a new tenancy, then uh, yeah, you'd be entitled to potentially claim that back from the old outgoing tenant from their deposit. But um, if that's not being the case, then yeah, there's, there's not really going to be any anything for you to claim back. Yeah, I did um, discuss that. So this particular agent is taking more than one month's tenant fine fee, which is outrageous to start off with. And um, but I suppose, and she said part of that is still payable because of course it's not, couldn't be recouped in one month rent. 
Well, I, I think you you probably have a, a case to argue against the the agent not having consulted you about the termination, early termination. You know, um, I think um, that you would you would definitely have have a right of recourse there because um, you know the agent should have consulted you, um, so you you had the ability to make a a judgment call on 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 how to go forward. So, um, because had the agent consulted you then you'd have had the opportunity to go back to the tenant and say, I'm happy for you to go, but I'm going to incur these costs and therefore I want to deduct you from the deposit. And that's the, otherwise um, you're in breach of contract. Um, well, there's a new, yeah, there's a new thing that's popped up. So there is damp in the property, but they never give us move out reports or pictures. So we didn't see how bad it was. We refused to fix it up. And well, the uh, agents didn't provide you with the information. They never, they've never given us a move out report. Right, right. Okay, well, there again, um, you know, I think you need to go back to the agents because um, uh, check in reports, check out reports, particularly inventories and schedules of condition um, are paramount now when it comes to making deductions from deposits. Because if you get into a situation where you're looking to make a deduction from a deposit, um, then if the tenant disagrees with that, it will go to the arbitration. And the first thing that the arbitration is going to ask for is, is evidence of check-in, check-out reports so they can compare the condition before and after, et cetera, in determining the, the value, if any, deductions to be made from the deposit. Yeah, so they're suddenly saying that one issue is a damp and we didn't know about it, but we've never seen how bad it was. And then suddenly the toilet seat's broken. Well, that definitely would have been raised by the rogue tenant because he was, you know, looking for every excuse. And and also I understand that tenants are responsible to make sure that they don't um, cause excess damp. And he, there was definitely a lot of damp that we had to spend a lot of money fixing up in the bathroom. And that wasn't there before. Yeah. There's two spots. So, but I don't think they even got a deposit from this guy. So we were stuffed on that one. But now there's the toilet seat and I'm saying, well, was it clean? Are there any issues? Are there any bills? And what about this toilet seat? And they're just not responding. They're responding to what they want and ignoring what they don't want to respond to. Sounds as though that there's certainly a, a number of shortcomings there. I mean, particularly if they haven't taken deposits and things like that, because there's no opportunity to, to, to make any clawbacks, etc. And I think um, you have to look very closely at the agent that's acting for you there as to whether they've, they've been working in your interest because at the end of the day you are the client um and they're they're responsible to you and if you're not happy then maybe you need to um go down the route of um of making a, a complaint towards the um the, the 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 governing body whoever that you know um they're governed by because they may they may belong to they may be an ala registered agent or a ucala based agent so in the first instance, it, it may potentially be an opportunity for you to go and talk to their regulator um, to discuss your, your concerns and, and see where it goes from there. Well, I don't think that's a good idea. It's a rough area out there. And um, yeah, I'd be quite nervous to do that. But so, uh, ha Sorry, how, how do you mean? Um, okay, so there's a, it's a set of two flats and... Um, Oh, yes, no, but I'm, I'm, I'm talking about going to the governing body, the regulator of the agent. So, um, yeah. you know, if you're, if you're not happy with your agent, if, if you, the first thing you need to do really is to, is to follow the agent's um, complaint process. If you are not happy with the outcome of that complaint process, then you have the right to refer the matter to their governing body, um, such as UCALA or ALA, um, and, and going on from there, potentially the ombudsman. So there are steps that you can take. Um, I mean, it does sound as though the agent's certainly not um, uh, acting in your best interest at all, based on no, what you're not. And we didn't, obviously, when you're, we haven't come across some of this before. So they pushed us to accept the last tenant, I think, without the deposit. I think I'd have to check the email exchange, but I don't know. There's, um, well, and it's uh, possible they moved this current tenant into another property of theirs and then found someone for us. There might have been games going on in the background. Right. Well, I think things certainly that you should be questioning um, and, and asking for is a copy of the tenancy agreements because you can actually then see because you, you're, you're concerned as to whether they did or didn't take a, a deposit from the previous tenant. Well, maybe you need to ask for a copy of the contract because if the tenancy agreement drawn up by the agent um, 
makes provision for a deposit and they've not collected the deposit, then that's down to them. Um, and um, also ask them for evidence of um, their check-in and check-out reports. Yeah, we've never had those. So they yeah, just yeah, sent a couple it, of photos. So it's, yeah, I can you, go you, back. I've got the tenancies. I can go back and check. I can't yeah. Really absolutely I, I would certainly um, strongly recommend that you you check I think you need to check several things I think you need to check any contract that you have with the agent themselves check the content of that um, I think you need to um, if you received copies of the tenancy agreements you need to go through those tenancy agreements just to make sure that you're happy that they cover um, all aspects of the tenancy including collection of deposits rents etc and also things like early termination clauses and things like that, they should all be covered in the tenancy agreement. So you need to make sure that those tenancy agreements um, are as they should be. Um, and, and also you're entitled, um, again, you, you need to check the level of service that the agent's offering you. And does that include check-in inspections, check-out inspections, inventory reports, and things like that, because then you're totally justified in asking for copies of that documentation. Okay, I just looked at the previous rogue tenant and there was no deposit taken. Right, okay. Um, because, again, there's no requirement for a landlord to take a, a deposit if they don't want to. Um, but if an agent has been acting for you and not taken a deposit, then by whose authority have they done that? And if it's not yours, then again, you know, you need to be asking the agent why they've acted on that basis without discussing the matter with you. Because it's you that's financially lost out, not them. No, no, there was an exchange and they sort of lead you along. It's only when you end up in this situation that you learn by <laughs> through your mistakes, really. And that's what's happened. So right. um, they did sort of lead us by the nose on that one. Yeah. I'm just looking at their terms. Now. I mean, it's, 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 it's very difficult to, to, to comment and discuss um, without seeing the whole picture, etc. But on, on, on the brief sort of um, points that you've outlined tonight, um, it, it, if those are correct, then I, I really think you need to be looking at other options as, as in other agents. Yeah, that's um, I just put a post on Facebook to try and, it's very limited out there. I think there's, well, there's four estate agents I came across. So. In, in your area? Yeah, it's a poor area. It's up in um, Durham. Ah, right. Okay. Okay. But yeah, I think I might look around. Yeah, I mean, um, the other thing, I, I, I don't know, are you a, a member of the NRLA at all? No, I'm not. So, um, uh, much, is it is it, and how much this discount is? Uh, much the it's discount? it's um it, it's seventy five pounds for a year's um, subscription, and I think um, using that code that I gave you earlier, you, you'll get a discount down to I think you get a fifteen percent a fifteen pound discount off that, um, and and that is tax deductible as well. So, um, you know, a lot of the the points, and, and I think this is a very valid example of, of where the NRLA will help members like yourself because if you have um, an agent acting on your behalf and you're just not quite happy with certain aspects of what the agent's doing for you then that's what the membership line is there for you to pick up the phone speak to the advice line discuss these sorts of issues at the time that they occur because then you able to go straight back to the agent you know from a point of authority and, and, and informed um, as to as to what's right and what's wrong um so i'm just looking through their terms and it states categorically that they do take deposits right to rent check and deposit oh, I mean. <laughs> yeah yeah and um, um, you i, 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 I think yeah, yeah I, I, can you, be performed but sorry because they say inventories can be performed it's, it's 60 pounds except that we do have the fully managed so it should be included and that we've asked uh, time and time again for photos, proof of work, proof of problems up there. And, um, yeah. Yeah. That doesn't sound a very healthy um, situation at all because it doesn't appear that they're fulfilling a lot of the, the terms of their contract to you, to be perfectly honest with you. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, the, the other thing uh, where I was talking about whether you're a member of the NRLA, notwithstanding what I've just said, you know, the values of being there, but the other um, opportunity you could have had is, is to... Um, contact the local um, uh, NRLA rep covering that area because he might have been able to help put you in touch with an agent that he might feel is, is, is good. Yeah, do you also um, recommend, we want to get an independent damp proofer in there, so do you have 
those sort of recommendations too? Um, we don't. We don't necessarily. Again, with the merger of the NRLA, with the, sorry, the NLA and the RLA, both organisations um, in their own rights had what they called a list of preferred suppliers um, from various walks of life. Um, so at the time, you would have probably been able to access a preferred supplier that specialised in, in that area. Um, but since the merger, um, all of those preferred suppliers are currently under review. So we've, we've not had the time and the opportunity to put that panel back together at the moment. Um, but again, as I said, um, your area rep may or may not have contacts that he might be able to help you with. Yeah. So, um, Julie, can are you able to send that um, offer through again so I can look at it tomorrow to, um, if I want to sign up? Yeah, absolutely. So this recording will be uploaded to YouTube tomorrow. It'll be on the YouTube channel. So um, everything that Vic has spoken about tonight, all of his slides will be available. But I did write the code down and it was R129 for the discount. Yeah. Okay. If, if, you, if you go on to the NRLA website, um, Susan, you, you'll actually, there'll be a, a button that you can just click um, to start the, the membership application. And it's a fairly simple application process. And it only take you about five minutes, I think. But um, uh, if you have any, um, if you have any queries or any 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 issues with it, then feel free to, to get in touch with me. I mean, I can give you um, my email address, um, which is uh, Vic. That's spelled V I K. Dot Doors D A W S at N R L A. Dot Org. Dot UK. Okay, right. So do feel free to contact me if you if you need any help there. Do you guys recommend agents, or is that part of the suppliers that you don't have those as well? Uh, no, they, again, yes, they, they, they're part. We we don't we don't um, recommend agents. We don't really recommend anybody. Um, we we have like I said, we have a preferred supplier list, and basically. Um, the preferred suppliers are providers of services that apply to us to go on to our panel um, and we carry out due diligence checks etc on suppliers to ensure that we're happy for them to go on the panel but we don't necessarily recommend um, one or other. Mm. Okay thanks. Thanks Susan and um, just obviously everything Vic said uh, you know absolutely corroborate that. I just wanted to go back to your original question about keeping the deposit from the tenant. Um, the problem here is the breach has actually been on the letting agent side rather than the tenant. Um, so I don't think you'd be in any position to be able to keep the tenant's deposit because the way the deposit scheme look at the deposit is it's the tenant's money at all time. The landlord must prove otherwise. And unfortunately, the breach of tenancy has been accepted by the letting agent who works on your behalf. So I don't think you'd be in a position, unfortunately, to be able to claim against the tenant because theoretically they haven't actually done anything wrong. They've asked to leave, they've handed back the keys and that has been accepted. That's a very good point, actually, Julia. Yeah. Yeah, okay, thanks. Yeah, someone else pointed that out to me as well um, when I was on the Facebook thread. And yeah, yeah, thanks. Thanks. Does anybody else get any other questions or any other situations they want to discuss with us this evening? No? Everyone's watching the football? <laughs> okay, well, if nobody else has got any further questions and nothing else that they want to discuss with us, then I will bring the meeting to a close. So thank you so much, Vic, for coming on and doing this for us again um, this evening. Really Pleasure. appreciate that. There's an, an awful lot of information um, that we need to digest now with regards to the courts opening and everything else that's going on, not to mention Brexit as well. Um, obviously, our next meeting will be in October. I've got to set those dates yet. And then we'll have another NRLA meeting, um, possibly December, but we'll see how the lockdown takes us. Who knows? We might be in physical meetings by then. So um, thank you very much. And like I say, it will be available on YouTube as of tomorrow. Um, and any questions you can obviously post on there and I can get them across to Vic as well. So again, thanks very much for your time tonight, Vic. And thanks everyone for joining. Pleasure. Thanks everybody. Bye. Good night.